for him. I'll live for him. And you see the scripture notation, Titus 2.12. Live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Well, um, he read last week, but he's back again. That reader of readers, Joshua. And he'll be reading from? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. Uh, that's kind of brief. Start at verse 1. <laughs> okay. And go over to 15. Yeah. Okay. We need a, we need a full... Mm. I have 1 to 23, so I have one to 23. 1 to 23, then. Joshua. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, I think that's what I originally gave him. It's a whole chapter, right? Yes. Yeah, a chapter. You know, we need a chapter here. All right. So, first Corinthians. You know, we need a chapter because the verse a day won't keep the devil away. We need a. We need a. You know, we like. We like. We like. First Corinthians. Double cheeseburgers. Okay. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 23. Okay. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Amen. Amen. It's an encouragement to all of us um, because we're all in, at uh, different stages of life. We all have different issues that we're dealing with. And, um, some we make public and others we don't. Uh, but God is for us, not against us. The key is, are you with God? Do you know Him in the part of your sins? Because He's for those who are with Him. And every believer, absolutely every believer, outside of John 3.16, which is the most well-known verse in the Bible, every believer knows Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. The key word is, do you love God? 
to them that love God, to them who are called to the purpose. See, we know that he's working all things together for our good. Not everything that we go through is good. There's evil that comes at us. Joseph acknowledged that in Genesis 50, 20. He told his brothers, you meant it for evil. He didn't minimize that. He said, but God meant it for good. Amen. So he did not have any envy or uh, any uh, malice in his heart toward his brothers because he came to realize that what the, the evil they did to him, God used that for his good and the good of his family. Where he was able to save the nation of Israel uh, through that seven-year famine which wiped out a whole lot of people. So God's at work in our life, and we just got to keep Him as the focus. As I've often said on many occasions, the question is, who and what, not why? God rarely answers why questions, and Satan will use why questions to drive you crazy. Because God's not coming answering why questions for the most part. It's always who and what. And though the answer to those two never change. Who? God. He's the sovereign ruler of the universe. That's why we're doing this extended study in, in Genesis to remind us of God's in charge, not most of the time, some of the time, or when things are going our way, but all the time. And you gotta, you gotta believe that, you gotta exercise faith in that because listen, there's a lot of evil that's going on in the world. And we run up against it personally. We deal with physical and, and, and emotional and mental issues personally. But who? God's in charge. And what? What is he doing with all the things that are going on in your life? Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29. See, he works all things together for good to them that love him. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So why are you going through this? Why are you going through that? Because God is conforming you to the image of his son. That's what it's all about. He's, he's working through the situations, circumstances, disappointments, heartaches, the trials, troubles, difficulties to make you more like his son, Jesus Christ, in your character and in your conduct. That's what it's all about. That's why you have all of those difficulties, tragedies, trials. And so James can say to us in James chapter 1, count it all joy when you fall into different trials. How can I do that? Because I know that God is at work in my life conforming to the image of Christ. Listen, when you're chipping stuff off, it hurts. It hurts to go through those things. But God is making you into the image of his son. He's improving you and I. It's called sanctification. And so the believer never has to wonder why this happened to me and why that happened to me. God is conforming you to the image of his son. He's already given us the answer. Is it easy? No. Will you experience difficulty, pain, heartache? Yes. But Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. And 1 Peter teaches us very clearly that suffering is God's will for believers. It's not this health, wealth, and prosperity nonsense that's touted over the television by these television preachers and all this. Everything's not going to go your way because you trusted Jesus. Everything ain't going to work out the way you like it. But God does promise that he will work everything together for your good. Now the question is, do you believe God or do you, believe, or you, do you not believe God? And when you trust God, the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah 8.10, becomes your strength. Strength for what? To get through the difficulties of life. See? Because as you continually complain and complain and complain about what's going on in your life, it drags you down. But when you rejoice in the Lord despite the circumstance, when you do a Job, <coughs> you're able to go through the trials of life. That's why Job is one of Carolyn's favorite books. Because of some of the physical things she's had to deal with. Not to mention being married to me for 40 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't know about married me. <laughs> I know too much about me. <laughs> but you see, God's at work in my life too, conform me to the image of Christ. And so that's how we make it. See? It's a real faith in a real God that we can't see. 
But it's not make-believe, it's not pie in the sky, it's not by and by until I get to heaven. That ain't working. I need something that's going to help me now. And I need truth that will set me free. And that's what the book of the, that's what the Bible is all about. It's God's truth to set you and I free. So that we don't walk through life in fear. We walk through life by faith. We trust God. Well, that's the sermon before the sermon. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm so thankful to see Chiquita. I'm encouraged by her presence today. I really am. Uh, and as, as, as Sidney made a very good point, uh, which did it more often, it, it, it would be good if, because we pray a lot of prayers. And it lets you write them down. And I know Carolyn does this at home. Uh, writes them down and then come back and talks about how God answered those prayers. And then, see, that's an encouragement to you. Uh, Christians used to do a lot of journaling, and I think that's kind of coming back for some people. I've never been a journaler, uh, but, uh, but I do uh, understand that that uh, is what many Christians do. And then it, it, it encourages you. Because you know what? Sometimes you need to go to others to help you make it through. And sometimes, you, you know, it's just like going to CVS. What not? You, you know, you sometimes you go to the doctor and get prescription medication, and sometimes you got to go and get uh, over-the-counter stuff and medicate yourself. And yeah, there are times you need to go to other people, and but then there are times you you just need to get along with God and and and, and medicate yourself through communing with Him. That's why daily devotion. It's not just to waste your time; it's to help you reconnect with God every day. Because listen, every day has challenges, difficulties ups and downs and all arounds and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, if you know the Lord, that's why you don't need to take drugs and drink alcohol and, and, and take the ultimate way out of commit suicide, which many people do because they don't have no hope. But Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, our God is a God of hope. And why do people commit suicide? Because they have come to a place in their thinking that they believe that they are hopeless and that there's no way out. That's why people turn to drugs, or turn to drink, to alcohol. Listen, I, I need something to anesthetize myself from the realities of the difficulties that I'm dealing with every, every day. So I'm turning to these things to just take my mind off of them. But you see, when you fill your mind with God's word and you fill your life with prayer and worship, you have the greatest medication you could ever have to help you get through. And not just, well, I'm just trying to make it by. No, you can triumphantly walk through life with all of its challenges. Because see, you've got somebody that's leading the way. His name is God. His name is Jesus Christ. And we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. So, <laughs> We can live the victorious life. It's not the arrogant life, but it is the victorious life. And it's bound up in the person of Christ so that the difficulties and challenges of life do not destroy us. They help us to depend upon God more and more. And we see his hand of blessing. Uh, what's the old saying? He may not come when you call him, but he's, he's always on time. on time. He's an on time kind of God. All right? And, and that's why the most important thing for you in a Christian life is to get to know him. It's the most important thing. So Paul says in Philippians 3, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings. Oh, you've been a Christian 25, 30 years. What's important? Knowing him. Knowing him. Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, 33, that this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ you sin. What is what's important is knowing God. So why do we study the scriptures? Why do we learn the Bible? It's to know God more intimately because uh, you trust the ones you know. You trust the ones you know. And the ones you know intimately, you trust more perfectly. And so the more we get to know God, we will trust him more. And so it doesn't depend on us and our abilities. Listen, we're getting older, we get limited. Man, it's, just, uh, it's, it's, it's rough. I got leg ailments. I got back ailments. I got all kind of ailments now. 
that I ain't know nothing about 20, 30 years ago. And it's just caused me to realize how much more I have to depend on the Lord. Because see, my physical strength is waning as I get older, and it's going to keep waning. But while the outward man is perishing, the inward man can be renewed day by day as you walk with the Lord. And you can grow stronger in Him. Well, let me get to the message. Uh, I just am so encouraged by uh, Shaquille's presence. And uh, just uh, her determination to trust the Lord. I mean, because you could give up. She could have given up and said, I'm, I'm not going forward anymore. I got all these difficulties to travel. Why not just check out a lot? A lot of people do that. Every day. They give up. But the God we serve is a God who enables us to keep going. Well, good morning, uh, NCBC and friends. Last week we looked at Abraham's question to God. In Genesis 18, 25, Shall not the judge of all the earth uh, do right? So we consider the idea that God is the judge of all the earth. God is the judge of all the earth because he is the creator and owner of all. The psalmist said in Psalm 24, 1, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. God created all and owns all and therefore is the judge of all. God judges because of sin. And Romans 3.23 says that all have sin. You, me, my mama, your mama, uh, your sweet little grandchildren, all have sin. Right? They come short of the glory of God. And Hebrews 9.27 teaches us that after death there is judgment. We also learned according to John 5.22 and 27 that God has delegated all judgment to the Lord Jesus Christ. So all men will face the Lord Jesus Christ as their judge for their sins unless they have repented of their sins and received Jesus as Savior and Lord. Then they are exempt from the judgment of God for sin according to Romans 8.1. Okay? We closed last week's message uh, stating that there are judgments to come in the future. And I want to discuss at least four of them uh, in the next few messages. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment of Israel, the judgment of the Gentiles or nations, and the great white throne judgment. So today I want to begin uh, to discuss with you the judgment seat of Christ. Herman Hoyt, in his book, uh, The End Times, states, Strongly entrenched in Christian theology is the belief that there is one general a judgment. But an intense, inductive study of the scripture material uh, displays the fact that this cannot be true, end quote. In researching uh, this issue of judgment, I found that non-dispensational theologians had this view. Contemporary theologian, uh, Miller Erickson in his Systematic Theology and Wayne Grudem uh, in his uh, Systematic Theology are held to this view. Uh, Wayne Grudem uh, in his Systematic Theology states this, according to a dispensational view, there is more than one judgment to come, a judgment of the nations, a judgment of believers' works, and a great white throne judgment, three different judgments. But Grudem further states uh, uh, this, the view taken in this book, that is his systematic theology, is that these three passages all speak of the same final judgment, not three separate judgments, end quote. Um, and uh, uh, that's the view of many. Uh, I, I know um, the uh, minister's manual, uh, and if you've been to any funerals, especially at the graveside, uh, many ministers read through one famous, uh, well-known minister's got the newer version that come out, but this is sort of a standard. And uh, it talks about the general judgment and the general resurrection. And I've crossed those out because I don't believe either there's a general resurrection or a, gen or a general uh, a judgment. 
but that's the view uh, of uh, many. On the other hand, uh, theologians such as Paul Ennis in his uh, book, The Moody Handbook of Theology, Lewis Perry Schaefer, founder of Dallas Theological Seminary in his Eight Volume Systematic Theology, and Charles Ryrie in his Basic Theology, which was a new book in 1985 when I was taking uh, theology courses right up the street here at Washington Bible College, uh, and that was the, uh, the theology book that we used at that time, Charles Ryrie's Basic basic theology, uh, they all teach that there are multiple, that is, different future judgments. So, my position, my belief, is that there are multiple future judgments, not just one general final judgment to come. So again today I want to discuss uh, what I believe is the, is the first of those to take place and uh, it's known as the judgment seat of Christ. So as you can see from your insert, you've got two points I'd like to go through. The first is declared. And so, if you have your Bible, turn to Romans 14.10. Romans 14.10. Romans 14. And it says, But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we, please note that pronoun, I'll say something about it in a minute. Uh, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now I'll turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse. Uh, 10. And here, uh, just, uh, I'll just read the verse. Uh, Paul states, uh, For we, and please note that pronoun again, I'll say something about it in a minute, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So here we can see from these two passages that it is clearly stated, it is declared. It is declared that there is a judgment uh, seat of Christ. So of course that should lead to the question, what is the judgment seat of Christ? Paul Ennis, in his uh, theology book entitled The uh, Moody Handbook, of theology has a helpful glossary. And uh, I always point this out to the students that, that uh, I teach at the college, that uh, whenever a book or a textbook has a glossary, you want to get as familiar with that as you possibly can, because they're good, concise uh, explanations of terms and, and words. And uh, so I always uh, encourage them, I always require them to read the glossary along with <laughs> the rest of the, whatever the text book reading they have to do always require the reading of the glossary and uh, then try to do some things out of that to help them because there's so much terminology and there's so many uh, things so usually these books give helpful uh, explanations that are concise and so Paul Ennis gives a concise uh, explanation he says the judgment seat of Christ the place or occasion for the divine evaluation of the faithfulness of Christian lives resulting in the giving or withholding of rewards. The judgment seat occurs in the heavenlies while the tribulation is taking place on earth. And I thought that was a good concise explanation of the judgment seat of Christ. The place or occasion for the divine evaluation of the faithfulness of Christians, Christians' lives resulting in the giving or withholding of rewards. The judgment seat occurs in the heavenlies while the tribulation is taking place on earth. The phrase judgment seat translates the Greek noun bima, which has resulted in this judgment uh, being called popularly the bima seat of Christ. But that's the Greek noun for judgment seat in, this, uh, in these passages. Uh, now please note uh, oh, also, 
that this judgment is a judgment only for believers. Only believers are at this judgment. Please note in Romans 14, 10 and 2 Corinthians 5, 10 that Paul is writing to believers in these respective cities, uh, Corinth and Rome, and he also identifies that it is for believers when he says and uses the personal uh, pronoun, plural, singular, uh, singular, first person, personal, pro, plural pronoun. I get it, uh, Teresa. Um, we, okay, and we, uh, when the word we is used, it means whoever the speaker is and whoever he's speaking to, right? So in this case, Paul's writing to the people in Corinth and he's writing to the people in Rome and he says, we, not you, not me, but we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And who is he talking to? He's talking to believers because he's one himself. So again, this, this validates the, the point that this is a judgment for believers. For believers. Uh, so then, the judgment seat of Christ, the beam seat of Christ is a judgment for believers only. Now this is not a judgment for sin. It's not a judgment for sin because Jesus took care of all believers' penalty for sin at Calvary. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Yes, Hallelujah! <laughs> what a Savior! Yes. And Romans 8.1 clearly says there is therefore now no condemnation, as the old King James said, there is now therefore now no judgment for those who are in Christ. The question is are you in Christ? Have you repented of your sins? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Then if you have, Romans 8, 1 applies to you. Now, further, <laughs> validation of this point comes from the very lips of Jesus. John chapter 5, verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. What judgment is talking about? Judgment for sin. He's removed our sins, the psalmist said in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west. And he's not bringing them up at the judgment seat of Christ. See? That's why we can say confidently to him, Jesus paid most of it. Oh. Paid it all. Okay. Yeah, paid it all. Well, Pastor, uh, uh, what about my future sins? Well, let me tell you something. When Jesus died on the cross, all your sins were in the future. Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> my future sins. Now, all of your sins were in the future. You hadn't even been born yet and committed them sins. And guess what? He already paid for them. Okay? So, don't get twisted. Well, what about my sins since I, 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 I became a Christian? Listen, he paid for them all, not most of them. Now, here's, what, here's the disclaimer, I guess, in some sense you've got to give. Many people don't like the doctrine of grace because they think it gives people a license to sin. No, it doesn't. Not true believers. True believers understand that they are saved by the grace of God. They're so thankful for that that they want to live an obedient life. They're not planning on sinning all they can because they're saved by grace. That person is, is not saved by grace. Because they're operating from an evil heart. Not a heart that's been changed by God. And that doesn't mean as Christians we don't sin. You sin, I sin, all the sin. So don't lie to yourself. All right, 1 John 1 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We ain't deceive nobody else. God, you ain't, certainly ain't deceiving God. You ain't deceiving especially if you're married, you ain't seen your husband or your wife, but they live with you every day and you center to you. They be thinking anyway. If they don't say it out loud. Alright? But, listen, that's why we go to 1 John 1 9. So what is the issue of the sins of the believer? The sins of the believer are family sins. It's not the judicial sins that would be dealt with in a court of law. See? God's our heavenly father. We're not just dealing with him 
as the judge and we're the condemned person that's coming to the courtroom. No, that was dealt with when Jesus became our substitute. We're in his family. He's dealing with his family. And God, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Okay? And that's why in this life, listen to me very carefully, in this life, God deals with our sin. Okay? So, here, let me put this to rest for you. Why is it these unbelievers doing all this sin that God ain't dealing with? Because it ain't his time to deal with them. There's a judgment coming for them that they're, they're going to uh, uh, um, meet the Lord. But see, he's dealing with his family. And you and I who uh, claim Jesus as our Lord said, he deals with us right now. That's why if you don't confess your sins, God says, let me, let me, let me do a little spanking. Let me, let me get your attention. Let me break something. Okay? Because, see, we don't hear too well. And when things are going our way, you know, it's okay. God will understand. No, he don't never understand sin. Did you understand the disobedience of your children when they were growing up? Well, I understand, y'all. Just slap me one more time. <laughs> yeah, right. Johnny got a backhand. You know, all this send them to time out, a bunch of nonsense. As my wife likes to say, uh, you go to time out and sit in the corner. And she likes to say, yeah, the kids walk over there and say, yeah, I'm going to do that again, Jack. <laughs> God said, spare the rod, spoiled child. So guess what we got? A couple of generations of spoiled children. Because everybody listening to Dr. Spock and all these other people with this psychological mumbo jumbo. And God says, I made some padding, and you need to make some water, and they'll make a change. <laughs> but see, we don't agree with God. We got a better way. And that's why we got the mess in society we got today. You cross the street there when three teenagers come, instead of them crossing the street or changing their language when you get up on top of them. The fear scared of you anymore. Because we haven't put the fear of God in them. Just let them run them up. So we got all of the nonsense that we got going on today. And we only have ourselves to blame. But we didn't listen to God. We didn't agree with God. We didn't do it God's way. We got a better way. And the better way is led to the mess we have today. Well, Jesus paid it all. So then the judgment seat of Christ is not a Sin judgment resulted in eternal punishment, but it works a believer's judgment resulting in reward. It's stated in 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Quickly, describe. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 3. And I'm not doing a full exposition of the passage. just want to briefly uh, note some things. As we talk about the scribe. So what takes place at the Bible Seat of Christ? Well, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 and 15. All right, we said this is the Bema Seat. Uh, the word Bema is used ten times in the New Testament. Uh, uh, it's the site of litigation in which a judge is present to issue official decisions. Um, uh, the physical seat upon which a ruler or or judge uh, set to uh, uh, give issue official decisions. And uh, when Paul uses this idea of uh, the term uh, Bema, see, judge seat is taken from the uh, uh, Grecian games where successful athletes uh, were rewarded for victory in athletic contests. And so Paul uses the uh, figure to uh, denote the giving of rewards to church age. Uh, believers. So in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, uh, 9 uh, through 15, Paul states that he and others were God's workers. The Corinthian believers were God's uh, field, God's building, uh, and that by the grace of God he had laid the foundation of Jesus Christ among them through uh, the preaching of the gospel. Christ is the foundation upon which all believers ought to build their lives and serve the Lord. The materials used according to verse 12 are high 
quality and low quality materials. Six uh, items are uh, no material. Paul says each one's works will be made known for the day. You see that in verse 13? We'll declare it. What day is he talking about? The Bible see the judgment day. The judgment of the believers. Because that's who he's talking to. Because the day will declare it. The Bible seat of Christ will reveal it. Those of high quality, uh, and in this uh, figure that he's using, uh, like gold, silver, and precious stone will survive fire, meaning that they are works, good works, that will be rewarded. But the low quality works of wood, hay, and straw will uh, burn up and not result in rewards, yet the person is saved. Uh, which is uh, what he says in verse 15. Verse 15. They will suffer the loss. That is, they will forfeit the rewards that they could have received because of faithful service to Christ. Faithfully living out their faith. God has already prepared the good works He wants each believer to do. Ephesians 2.10 For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has already prepared what he, he wants to get out of your life and mine. Already. So, what is the Christian life? It's about discovering. It's discovering what God would have me to do and then doing it. Well, how do I discover what God wants me to do? I have to, first of all, trust Christ as my Savior, become a believer, and then I need to read, study, and obey the Word of God. And as I live my life, God directs me in the way that He would have me be. First, it starts with be, being a part of some local church. We've got a lot of people today that think they, that God's okay with them floating and uh, not being committed and involved. Listen, they're going to be sadly disappointed when they meet him. Because you see, Jesus died for the church. It's not a trivial thing to him. It's an important thing to him. In fact, you want to know what Jesus is doing in the world today? <laughs> Matthew 16, 18. After Peter makes his confession, what does Jesus say? Upon this rock, I will build my church in the gates of hell. So what is Jesus doing in this age through the Holy Spirit? He's building the church. He's building the church. The universal church is the church that uh, is comprised of all believers all over the world on heaven and in earth. Okay. The ones in, in heaven are the triumphant church because they fought the fight and they've gained a the victory there in heaven. You and I are the church that's uh, still in the fight. See? Satan's not dealing with the believers in heaven. He's dealing with the believers on, on earth, though. He's the enemy, not the white man, the black man, or, or any other ruthless individual you can think of. Because Satan uses people just like God does. The enemy is Satan. A lot of Christians are confused about that. You know? It's the Republicans, it's the Democrats. <laughs> it's all this nonsense that's not in the Bible. The enemy is Satan. And Jesus said in John 10, 10, he's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What does he want to do? Kill, steal, and destroy. He hasn't changed that. That's what he's been doing since he led the rebellion thousands of years ago. And he's continuing that until Jesus puts him down. Okay? And God wants us to do his will. And since he's called no Christian to be a lone ranger, we need each other. Yeah, I may be the pastor of the church, but I can't do it without you. You can't do it without me. And we can't do it without each other. So that's why he says in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Seeing that that day is soon approaching. What day? The day that we're going to meet the Lord. What are you going to tell him? Well, you know, I was tired, Lord. I worked hard. That's why I couldn't get up and come to church on Sunday. Really? You think that's going to fly? <coughs> no. Well, you know, the pastor, I, no, I just didn't like that guy two months. That's why he joined the church. Well, that's why I left the church. Or whatever. What? Well, you know, he just wasn't perfect. Well, you weren't either. So what are you talking about? 
I mean, we got a million and one excuses why we don't do what God says. But listen, you're going to give an account when you meet him. And God is, the Lord is working through the church to impact the world. And many Christians don't understand that. That's why they're, they're not a member of a church. They don't contribute to a church. They're not involved in the church's ministry. They're not supportive of what the church is doing. It's, hey, it's about me and, and my walk with Jesus. No, I'm sorry. That, that's a misreading of the Bible. It's about us and our walk with the Lord. It ain't about just you. It's about us. And God's going to evaluate us on that. See? Because God has gifted every believer. Every believer has a spiritual gift. You have one and I have. At least, we all got at least one. And God intends for us to use them. And the main focus of spiritual gifts are to be directed toward other believers in the house of God. And you can't be exercising your gift toward me if you ain't here. Sorry. It don't work like that. What do we do with people outside the church? We evangelize. Because they're lost. They're going to hell. And it doesn't matter who they are and how much you love them and what you think about them. It doesn't matter what their position in life is and what they have achieved and obtained. They're going to hell. And so our responsibility is to share the gospel with them. Pray for them. Pray that they get saved. Because apart from that, they're not getting into heaven. So God has already declared what he wants us to do. It's a matter of discovery. As I walk with the Lord in obedience, I discover what he wants me to do. I'm using my gift to build up my brothers and sisters in, in Christ. Uh, and uh, we're growing stronger as a, as a people of God. See, God's never been impressed by numbers. He's always impressed with faithfulness. Okay. So that's why I don't get upset that we don't have every, every seat in here filled. I can care less about that. What I care about are the people who come and are part of the church, are they faithful? So that we can accomplish the work of God that he's given us to do as a church. That's what I care about. That's what I pray about. That's why I pray for you. And I pray that you'll be faithful. Because you, you know I will make any excuse to the Lord when we meet him. Not one that will fly. Okay. And uh, does commitment involve sacrifice? You better believe it does. All of us know that from going to our jobs. Did you go to work every day and you felt good? Did you only go to work when you felt good? Oh, you know I don't feel good today. I'm taking a mental health day. I did that back in the 80s. Burned up all my leaves. <laughs> we, we never went on vacations but I burned up my man, I don't feel good today. I ain't going to work. Hey Paul, that was my supervisor. I don't, I, man, I don't feel good today. I, I'll see you tomorrow. I burned up so much leave in the 80s. I took these mental health days all the time. I ain't going to use my job. But uh, I burned up all my leave. I, I remember people retired and I worked there 18 years. And people retired from the job, and they had thousands of hours of leave that they got paid for. I got zipped. Because I'm taking all these mental health days. No, I don't feel like going in today. You know, I don't know what was on TV. It could have been that much in the 80s. I mean, how much laying in the bed can you do? You know? But people take this sort of cavalier attitude toward the church. Well, I'm here, I'm not here. I'm Sorry, you're going to give an account to God. And how do we accomplish? You know, that's like a husband coming up. Well, honey, you know, I am so thankful I'm married to you. But you know what? It's Wednesday, honey. I'll see you Saturday when I come back. I don't even think that married to that. <laughs> or the wife said, you know, honey, man, it's Tuesday, and I just man, I just feel like I need a week out with the girls. So I'll see you come Sunday. <laughs> really? No. Huh? But that's how people treat the Lord. That's how they treat the church. They don't understand how important the church is to what God is accomplishing in the world. We're going to do a series of something on all of that. But anyway, let me move on. So the low quality of works of wood, hay, and straw will burn up and the person is still saved. God, uh, I've already said that. Um, your salvation is not in question. <laughs> the question is, are you doing those works that God has prepared for you? You see, your salvation is not in question. 
but your rewards are. So somebody might say, well, what's the big deal? Let me show you what the big deal is. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. Here's the big deal. Here's the big deal. Why it should matter to you and why it should matter to me. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 28. <clears throat> and now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, we may be confident and not what? Ashamed. Be ashamed before him at his coming. Why is it a big deal? Why is it a big deal? Because you don't want to be ashamed when he comes back. Why will any believer be ashamed at the Lord's coming? Because he or she was not faithful, was not obedient, did not serve the Lord as instructed and commanded in the Word of God. Yes, some Christians will be ashamed because of their lack of obedience to the Lord. So NCBC, are you obedient to the Lord? Are you doing the Lord's will? Are you living for Him each day? He desires to reward us. And we don't have time to look at these, but you can jot them down. 1 Corinthians rewards. 1 Corinthians 9.25. 1 Thessalonians 2.19. 2 Timothy 4.8. James 1.12. 1 Peter 5.14. John also said in 2 John 8, I, I want you to look at that, turn over there real quick, 2 John 8, verse 8, and look at what he says. John writing to these uh, believers, he says, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we work for, but that we may receive a what? Full reward. Full reward. See, some Christians only going to get partial reward because they were partially obedient. They weren't fully obedient. And so, you may be ashamed. Paul declared in 1 Corinthians 9, 24-27, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who complete, competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uh, uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should have become disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9, 24-27. Paul says, hey, you know what I'm concerned about? I don't become disqualified. He, he's not worried about losing his salvation. He's worried about losing his reward. So... He's seeking to do God's will, and he uses this athletic metaphor uh, to uh, describe what he's doing. Listen, he's going after it, full bear. He's not letting anybody else hold him up. That's why, you know what, I, I, I'm not trying to sound arrogant. Please don't take it that way. But whether you show up or don't show up, I'm going to show up. Because I, I made a commitment to the Lord. And whether one person here or ten people here or a hundred people here, I made a commitment to the Lord. See, I made a commitment to Him. He saved me. I, I'm coming. I'm going to worship the Lord. Amen. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to tell other people about Jesus. I can't control what you do. I can exhort you and encourage you. But you know what? You've got to make a choice. And you're going to meet Him with the choices that you made one day, just as I will. And I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And it's no way he's going to say that if you weren't faithful. It's just not going to happen. He's not going to make up something. So, let me close with this. It's an article. I, actually, it's from a book. And I printed this out. I was reading it. The auditorium was filled with hopes and dreams of the next generation. Graduation day had finally arrived for the senior class at Meteor Hill High School. With it came the individual stories of the young men and women who hoped to tackle the world. Susan had long dreamed of medical school. She knew that four more years of college was ahead of her before she was even 
before she would even get there. Still, this was a day to celebrate. Susan's strong academic record had put her at the head of the class, and this would uh, be the next step in her path to become a pediatrician. Her hard work was rewarded with scholarships for college. Chuck had taken a much different route through high school. His future was never his focus. Chuck spent his free time with his friends, seemingly without a care in the world. This changed his junior year when a guidance counselor finally set him down. Chuck was not on course to graduate, which meant that getting into a trade program to become a mechanic would have been out of the question. The final two years of high school, Chuck had buckled down and pulled his grades up. He was not proud of his grades throughout the years, but he was relieved that he had made it to graduation day. A terrible event in the life of Brett and his family just, uh, and his, a terrible event in his life led Brett and his family to celebrate this day. A year earlier, he had been involved in a car accident with some of his classmates. Brett was the only one with serious injuries. The smashed car collapsed on him and crushed his bones. He had, all, he had always been a good student and planned to attend college, but now rehabilitating his body took priority. It was a testimony of his determination to see him walk again. His parents were thankful that Brett was even alive and able to graduate. It has been correctly observed that the judgment seat of Christ can be compared to a graduation ceremony. Samuel Hoyt summarized the great teaching of the judgment seat of Christ in a way that is exceptionally clear. And I quote, The judgment seat of Christ need be, be compared to a commencement ceremony. At graduation there is some measure of disappointment and remorse that, remorse that one did not do better and work harder. However, at such event, the overwhelming emotion is joy, not remorse. The graduates do not leave the auditorium weeping because they did not earn better grades. Rather, they are thankful that they have been graduated, and they are grateful for what they did achieve. To overdo the sorrow aspect of the judgment seat of Christ is to make heaven hell. To underdo the sorrow aspect is to make faithfulness inconsequential. In CBC, we will all stand at the judgment seat of Christ. All our works as Christians will be judged. What we did for Christ in the power of the Spirit will be rewarded. What we did in the flesh and for self will be burned up and unrewarded. Let me challenge you today to faithfully serve Christ and encourage you who are serving Christ to continue in faithful service, doing the good works He prepared for each one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you for this brief message from the judgment seat of Christ may motivate us, for we will all give an account. And uh, we want to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. So Lord, forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Forgive us for a lackadaisical attitude toward you, to your word, toward the church. And help us uh, to be committed to you fully and completely. To be involved in the local church. To serve you. To serve our brothers and sisters in Christ and to take the good news of Jesus Christ to our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones who are unsaved. Lord, one day we'll give an account. And Lord, we want to be found well-pleasing in your sight. I pray your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, CJ and Joshua are going to uh, give you a chart. You can look over, and this is the basis of what we're going to be doing. Uh, for the next several weeks. But this is a chart uh, taken from Charles Priory's Basic Theology, which was my uh, textbook back in 1985. And this shows you the different judgments, the time, place, person, basis, result, and scripture references. And of course, you can see we did the very first one. But today, uh, the judgment of believers works. Uh, and uh, so hopefully this will be a helpful a chart to you. And uh, right, if you keep up with it, I'm going to put, like, okay, put mine in my Bible. We'll be looking at this issue for the um, next several uh, weeks. All right. Um, Is this for Sundays? Mm -hmm. For Sundays or for Bible study? No, Sundays. Right. Yeah. Because we're going to look at, we're not going to do all of them, but we'll do a, a few more of them in the next several weeks, what we're going to cover. So you've got to, that sort of gives you a preview of what the different uh, uh, judgments that are yet to come. Uh, and I hold to a multiple judgment uh, 
as I said, as opposed to those who hold to the view that this just is one great judgment day, along with one great resurrection day, and at some point we'll deal with the resurrection, the different resurrections that are denoted in Scripture, and talk about those as well. Um, can we sing one verse of Trust and Obey? 349. <laughs> Chiquita's presence here today, her husband and her grandchild, we are greatly encouraged. We're greatly encouraged to continue to be people of prayer because you are God who hears and answers our prayer, and she's living proof of that. We thank you and rejoice with Amber, who will be graduating tomorrow, and we pray your blessings upon her and the Nathan family. May they celebrate as we celebrated and uh, may do something a little more, uh, but we thank you for her. Thank you for each one that's here today, and bless us as we go. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you as you go. Tell Christian this. Mr. Wynn, everybody. Good to see you.